everybody. As you said, I'm Chandon, and I'm going to talk to you guys about machine learning and the brain. So basically what we're going to be trying to do is try to find the specific connections in the brain that underlie things like autism. And more generally, we're going to develop a statistical model that will let us analyze the brain in all forms of different disorders. So this really simply is just um, people are watching this video on the left. And on the right, we're going to see what an fMRI scan of the brain while they're watching it looks like. So you can see the representation changes over time slowly. It's very distributed. And there's a lot of um, intricate patterns that change that don't necessarily exactly correspond to things we can see in the video. So these kinds of problems are immensely complex. Um, and we need a lot of big data analysis to handle these kinds of very high dimensional problems. So I think this is basically the most interesting problem in the world because the connections in the brain basically represent everything that you are. All your memories, your personality, everything is represented somewhere in the structural connectivity of these neurons. And if we can find where these neurons are connected, how the differences between each other, between different people's brains are connected, we can find what makes you you. And more importantly, in the short term, we can look at the brains of people with disorders like autism or Alzheimer's, and we can look to the specific connections that find what these diseases actually are. This lets scientists try to cure these areas better. It leads to early diagnosis. Um, if you're not like me, if you're not super interested in the brain, these kind of techniques can easily be um, implemented in tons of other things. Any problem where you're trying to find connectivity, like genomics or like simple road mapping type algorithms, can use this kind of same algorithm. So um, this is basically the data pipeline for doing this kind of connectome problem. We start on the left by scanning a ton of human brains. And I didn't personally do this. The Human Connectome Project has worked for the last few years on this project. But they managed to actually scan thousands of people's brains um, in the way that we just saw. They um, tell them basically to get in the machine and do nothing, just try to relax. And they scan their activity over time by taking a video. And they've done this for not just ordinary people, but 500 people with and without autism, which is really important. That lets us find the differences. So we take those signals that we saw in that video and we try to condense them into um, a more reasonable number of signals. So that signal was a video, had a ton of pixels, something like 25,000 pixels. We want to have a manageable number of signals, otherwise we're not going to be able to get any information out of that high data, high dimensional data. So what we do is we condense it into 160 signals. I've only plotted five here. And we get time series data for those 160 signals. From that time series data, we can calculate the correlations between each of those signals. So the correlations intuitively represent, you know, if two things go up at the same time, they go down at the same time, they're correlated. Otherwise, we give them a zero correlation. Those signals don't really have to do with each other. And the goal of this is to get the connectome from that. When two signals go up together, it's very likely that those two brain regions are connected. And by doing this over the entire brain, we can find the specific map that yields these correlations. You might be thinking, well, we have these correlations. Don't we already have the brain map? And the simple answer to this is no. Um, so if we look first just at these green points, right? Imagine we have a brain that only has three areas, A, B, and C. And they're all correlated with each other. We might think there's connections between all three of the regions, A, B, and C. But if we look at B and then look at A and C, we can find that A and C are conditionally independent given B. This means that B actually explains all the correlations between A and C. This is important because if we look in the actual brain, there might not be a real connection in A and C. It just looks like there is because they're both connected to B. So we need to do high dimensional analysis, consider all possible configurations of these brain regions in order to find the actual um, set of connections that exist in the brain. Now, this might seem pretty simple given this example, right? This example shows six different nodes in the brain. Um, and then there's only two to the six possible connectomes, right? You could have each edge missing or absent. That's only 64 possibilities. But as soon as we scale it up to a reasonable number, like 160, we get way too many possibilities. 10 to the 78th, that's more than the number of atoms on Earth. It's not a feasible search space. So what we need to do is impose some constraints that allow us to actually understand what's going on. So the top right is going to show the equation that we uh, develop in the end. Um, unless you're familiar with graphical models, it's probably not going to make sense to you. What is going to make sense are these five words on the left. Um, the pictures aren't because they're all on top of each other. So non-paranormal assumption. We're going to assume the data is generated by some given distribution. Normally, people do a Gaussian distribution. It's the one everyone's the most familiar with. But if you look at this kind of brain data, you see that it's kind of skewed. What the non-paranormal distribution lets you do is it accepts the Gaussian and also accepts other distributions that can be one-to-one -one mapped onto the Gaussian. So if you square all the samples in a Gaussian, if you cube them, you get a skewed distribution that looks more like what we actually see here. Second, we're going to ask for sparsity. So sparsity has a lot to do with the explainability of models. That's been talked about a lot by, by previous talks. 
Sparsity basically just means we don't want a lot of connections in our model. We want a few number of connections so that we can actually understand what's going on. If we say these thousand connections are the connections that lead to autism, that doesn't actually yield any useful insights because we don't actually know where to look, we don't know what pathways to target, so we want to be able to control somehow the number of connections in our model. Next, we impose a prior, and this is the biggest thing our work does that's missing from the state of the art. There's a ton of different kinds of brain data, not just that fMRI scan we saw, but also MRI scans, physiology that you can do, you can actually image a brain. And because of this, we know a lot about the brain that lets us impose more constraints on this model than we could beforehand. For instance, we know the brain doesn't like to have long-range connections because it costs a lot of energy and it wastes a lot of space to have things connected um, without actually doing any computation. Because of this, we want to favor shorter edges over longer edges. But more importantly than that, um, if you look at that kind of picture of the brain, we know a lot of different regions that exist in the brain, things like the basal ganglia, things like the temporal lobe. And we know that these regions are more likely to be interconnected with themselves than with each other. So by imposing this kind of prior, we can take out a lot of the edges that we might think are represented by our correlations right away. And this leads to a much smaller search space and a much more reasonable search space, especially when we don't have a lot of different people, a lot of different samples to draw our model on. Um, next, we can do multitask learning. And what multitask learning does is let you model a bunch of different groups at the same time. So if I have 500 subjects with autism, 500 that are control, 500 with Alzheimer's, I can run the same model try to try to estimate the shared connections for all of them, and at the same time, try to find the differences between all of them. What this lets us do is using more data, we can get more robust estimates of the shared connections. We can have higher confidence that we got correctness. And by modeling the differences individually, we can very easily uh, find the edges that lead to these disorders. It lets us better visualize the data. And finally, this equation is parallelizable. You can solve it column-wise. Um, if any of you are into opt optimization, that yields uh, massive performance results, especially over the state of the art. So uh, let's look at how the results look. This first left one is basically just checking if our model works. So we're going to plot on the y-axis the average edge length included in our model. And we're going to try to have shorter edges in the model like I talked about. We want to penalize having long edges because the brain doesn't like long edges. And we see that the more we penalize it, the shorter our edges get. We see um, uh, that you know the yellow and the green lines have very high penalization, and as a result, they get very short edges, which is exactly what we want. So this just shows the model's working. Now let's look at the actual results. The second graph shows the log likelihood generated by our model versus a bunch of baselines. So the dotted red line shows how our model is doing. Log likelihood intuitively represents, given a certain amount of edges, how much of the correlation do you explain? So we want to pick the smallest amount of edges that explain most of the data. And we see that our model is very good at that, particularly at low graph sparsities. And low graph sparsities are when we have a small number of edges, a small number of connections in our model. And this is very good because it means we're finding the correct edges that are needed to explain the correlations in our data. The third graph shows not only are we explaining our data well, but we're actually able to classify autism or non-autism based on the edges we're finding. This is probably the most important result. If we do stuff like take half the data, train the model to find edges that are different between the non-autism and autism class, do those edges actually represent what autism is? The only way we can try to uh, find that using our data is to take those edges and predict on the rest of the data that we haven't seen yet, um, do these people have autism or not? We see that our dotted red line shows that we can do it with very high accuracy, something like 75%. Um, and that means that we can actually find these edges that have statistically significant um, impacts on these different diseases. And then finally, so that's all machine learning uh, stuff. That stuff is applicable to a ton of different domains. These are the specific conclusions we get regarding autism. Um, so we see first that these five areas are the most linked to autism if we consider whether or not they're underconnected or overconnected um, as compared to just the control group. And four of these areas have already been linked to autism. This is very good. It means we're getting consistent results with the state of the art. Um, one of them has uh, potential links and probably needs further investigation. So this is a very good first step towards understanding disease. The second step for a study like this or for experimentalists to do is to take, now break down one of those regions, do the entire study, but instead of having 160 regions that represent the entire brain, have 160 regions that just represent one of these areas. And by doing that, you can break down that area. You can actually understand, not just at this uh, you know, whole brain type level, what areas affect autism, but what, at a connection level, what is actually affecting it. And then next, we can just look at some of the brains we develop. Um, at, a particularly spar at a particular sparsity level, we can see an autism graph looks something like that. A control graph looks something like that, and the difference looks something like that. Um, this shows a bunch of the things that my model 
um, was talking about. We see that short edges are more present than long edges. We see it's relatively sparse. We don't have tons of connections everywhere. We see a bunch of shared edges between the two things because the difference isn't all that um, big. And if we look at enough of these, we see that the autism group overall is underconnected, um, which is relatively consistent with the, what a lot of neuroscientists think at this point, is that autism leads to some underconnectivity overall in the brain.